Good evening. My name is Alice Greenwald. I'm president and CEO of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. And it is my privilege to welcome you here this evening. Um, as always, we are so pleased to see our museum members in the audience and to extend this welcome to those tuning in to our live web broadcast at 911memorial.org slash live. I also want to welcome um, our trustee board member, Andy Senchak, who is also co-chair of our education committee, uh, the oversight committee for the kinds of public programs you are going to experience this evening. Uh, to say we live in precarious times is an understatement. This memorial and museum stand in witness and in testament to one of the most profound ruptures in national and global security in the history of our country. The threats to our safety and societal foundations seem to proliferate daily. As we confront the unthinkable specter of nuclear aggression, an erosion of confidence in verifiable facts, vulnerability to external interference in our elections, and the reality that despite the truly heroic efforts of our law enforcement and intelligence agencies, we are still not immune from terror striking the homeland. Just five weeks ago, only blocks from where you are now sitting, our neighborhood and our city were once again rocked by unimaginable violence. On that beautiful fall afternoon, we were reminded again of the fragility of life and how in the blink of an eye, innocent lives can be taken in an unconscionable act of indiscriminate murder. This new normal brings with it uncertainty, fear, and grief. But it also calls forth voices of clarity and leadership. One of those voices belongs to our speaker this evening, an authority in many of the areas that matter most right now, geopolitics, intelligence, and cybersecurity. General Michael Hayden was director of the National Security Agency on 9-11, a position he held from 1999 to 2005. As a US Air Force four-star general, he became the highest ranking military intelligence officer in the country when he assumed the role of first principal deputy director of national intelligence in April 2005, followed by his service as director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 2006 to 2009. General Hayden worked under the Clinton, Bush, and Obama presidential administrations and is the first person in history to have led both the NSA and the CIA. The general's leadership in these organizations coincided with a momentous change in the landscape of global security, counterterrorism, and the growing cyber challenge. He could not have been better prepared for his roles having served also as commander of the Air Intelligence Agency and director of the Joint Command and Control Warfare Center, and having also held senior staff positions at the Pentagon, the US European Command, the National Security Council, and the US Embassy in Bulgaria. He is currently a principal at the Chertoff Group and a distinguished visiting professor at the George Mason University Shar School of Policy and Government. In addition to all of that, he is also the author of Playing at the Edge, American Intelligence in the Age of Terror, a New York Times bestseller that was selected as one of the 100 most notable books of 2016. Tonight, General Hayden joins the museum's growing roster of distinguished guests, which has included, among others, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, former CIA Director John Brennan, and current FBI Director Christopher Wray to discuss the current moment in national security and how it has been shaped as a result of 9-11. We are deeply honored to have General Hayden with us tonight, and I want to thank him sincerely for sharing his time and insights with us. We are also very grateful to the David Berg Foundation for supporting the museum's 2017-2018 public program season. Please join me in welcoming General Michael Hayden in conversation.
Saki will be in conversation with the museum's executive vice president and deputy director for museum programs, Clifford Channon. Thank you. Thank you. I was worried. I, I was <clears throat> cut off in the applause for your enthusiasm for the general. Um, general Hayden, thank you. Uh, let thank me you. add my thanks to Alice. And, and um, <clears throat> I want to ask you, you were running one of America's principal intelligence agencies on 9-11. Yeah. And I'd like to know that story. But first, tell us, as the man who was running it, what NSA does sure. and what it was doing at that <clears throat> time, and then how you swung into action, your response to what happened. Yeah. Um, the entire American intelligence, American espionage enterprise is frankly designed to get information other people would deny us. Um, you know, the bumper sticker is, we steal secrets. Right? Uh, now, we divide up how we steal, and that's how we're organized. All right? So CIA steals through human sources. NGA, if you want to know the alphabet soup, ask in the Q&A. NGA takes pictures. NSA, the National Security Agency, um, participates in communications for which it is not the intended recipient, is the best way I can. <laughs> right? and, and so, in, in essence, it eavesdrops. Now, in, in, in a traditional in a traditional passive sense, you know, you, 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 you hit the button on the radio, you send out waves, the waves propagate, you put an antenna up. If you've got the gear, you've got the kit, you can get the signal, you can turn the signal into something intelligible to the human ear. In the modern era, uh, that enterprise also includes, rather than just kind of passive catching something someone decides to toss, in the modern computerized, interconnected, globalized, World Wide Web world, NSA is also authorized to break and enter into adversary networks and to pull information out that they may never have intended to transmit. Right? But in essence, it, it's the electro electronic communications arm of the American espionage enterprise. So 9-11 uh, comes. I believe you were at work early that yep. morning. Take yep. us through the day. Sure. Hard to go come to work early. 9-11 uh, was a Tuesday, uh, Monday night football. Um, it was the opening of the Denver Broncos Stadium, their, their new stadium in Denver. And I remember <coughs> staying up and watching the game. Came in. I had a haircut appointment at 7. We have a barber shop inside NSA. It's on the far side of our headquarters complex. So I walked through there, got a, got a quick haircut, came back. Just because it was on the way, I stopped into our operations center, kind of the, the brain of the global SIGINT, Signals Intelligence Enterprise. What's going on? Quick briefing, nothing exceptional. All right, just what's going on in the world. Back into the office and started working off the day schedule. Uh, a little after nine, my executive assistant came in and said a plane at the World Trade Center. And like most who are not in New York, it was... You know, the image was sport plane, small plane. How did that happen? Looks like a clear day. Went back to work. Um, executive assistant came in a second time and said a plane at the other tower. And at which point, you know, anybody who does this for a living says Al-Qaeda. And so I said, get the head of security up here right away. And as he came up, a, a, a great fellow named Kemp, Kemp Enser, as he came up and was coming in one door in my office, my executive assistant was coming in the other and said there are reports of explosions on the mall. That's the, the Washington Mall. That's a garble of the plane hitting, hitting the Pentagon. So my security chief hasn't spoken a word yet. I said, Kim, all non-essential personnel out of here now. And he silently turned, went out, and we began to, to get non-essential personnel out of uh, NSA headquarters. NSA is big. Um, it's actually, it's actually an American intelligence agency that it's declassified its population. It's uh, 35,000 people, comprises the National Security Agency. About half of them work at Fort Meade. Just outside of Washington. Just, uh, yeah, Maryland. it's uh, closer to Baltimore than Washington. It's outside of both beltways, all right? Um, and so non-essential to part. I mean, it was hard to count, yeah. but we, we figured between five and 7,000 remained, eight to 10,000. Then, then left. I then um, decided to decamp. You see those iconic pictures when you're watching your old Will Smith movies, Enemy of the State, and you've got those tall buildings. 
That's where the director's offices are. And I directed everybody who's staying out of the tall buildings. And we have a, we have a long low rider building that's our original ops building. It's only three stories high. And I said, move everybody who's essential into those spaces. I went there because that's where the ops center was, where I'd visited in the morning. And so I spent the rest of the day uh, at, the, at the operations center. George Tennant called me about eh, 1030, maybe, maybe a little later, quarter of 11. George, I'm sorry, George was the DCI. He was the director of central intelligence. He said, what do you got? I said, George, I got celebratory gunfire on the Al-Qaeda network. In other words, we were hearing them high-fiving one another with the success of the attack. And he, he just said, yeah, yeah, we know. No, no. Um, at which point, we began to slew the American SIGINT enterprise, which your tax dollars built, and it's really big. And, I mean, we were, we were dropping other requirements off left and right. I mean, prior to 9-11, terrorism was important. But there are a lot of other things going on in the world. You, you had to divide up your resources. Or about 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm throwing things out and bringing everything we have to bear, frankly, on Afghanistan and anything else in the, in, in the Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda network. It was what's technically called TWAA, Threat Warning Attack Assessment. Is there more coming? What happened? And so we were trying to gather that. About dusk, um, one of my officers reminded me that our counterterrorism shop was still in the high rises. Now, you have to understand, I mean, Fort Meade looks like it's a headquarters, and it is, but it's also the largest field station in the whole enterprise. And so when I say the counterterrorism shop, I mean people with headsets on, all right, who are listening, listening to conversations being queued up by this global enterprise. And because of the nature of the day, the nature of the attack, the nature of the mission, we could not afford to have them decamp from where they were and relocate because we would lose hours of coverage and we would just lie dormant and would not be listened to. And, and so we had to leave them in the, in the high rise. The point you make in the book is that uh, many, perhaps most of them, were Arab Americans yeah. because of the language facility. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I went up and uh, got there just about dusk. And if you remember the day, it was spectacular along the eastern seaboard. It was absolutely just a gorgeous day. And I walked in. It was just about sunset. Now, I, that, that's, that's about an eight-story building. I was probably about 6'4". If it had been much higher, if it had been much higher, I could have seen Fort McHenry. Okay, which was the last instant yeah. of America being bombarded in the in the forty eight, um, and I walked in, and and as you said, they're Arab Americans, so so they've got they've got a mission impact, all right, because their job is to stop that. They, they're, they're suffering as the nation is suffering because of what happened, and, and then since they are Arab American, there's probably more going on inside them as well. And, you know, there's nothing dramatic here. I mean, there are no speeches to be made. You know, you walk through, hand on shoulder, nod, press on, stay. It, it, was, it was genuinely presencing was all that I could offer. And then as I, um, as I got into the room, though, there was one other thing I need to share with you. Remember I said, we were a little bit higher. I could see Fort McHenry. Of course, we weren't, and I didn't. We were tacking up blackout curtains. The, the logistics force was there. And I had to thought, I'm in Eastern Maryland in the 21st century, and we are attacking up blackout curtains. It's going to be different here tomorrow. So you had spent a career in military, military intelligence, yeah. but does the gear shift for you? You are now at war in a way that had not been the case, going back yeah. perhaps to Vietnam. Um, what is the internal assessment you're making of where we are and what we need to be doing? Yeah, so, so, so what happens is, you know, NSA is a big enterprise, 35,000 people, global, big budget, balancing that mission with this mission, that requirement. I mean, we were, we were trying to retool. Remember I said to, up there with the catcher's mitt, catching the signals that were going out, or commuting to the target, getting into the network, pulling it off the computer? Well, we were over here. We knew our future was over here, and so we needed to take money we would normally spend to keep doing the traditional just catch the signals in the air and reinvest in everything we needed to become this new enterprise because we all changed how we communicated. 
And every time I would try to save a dime over here by pulling off mission, I'd get a phone call from a secretary of state or something saying, you can't, you can't ease your coverage up on Nigerian organized crime. Don't you know how important that is? And so we had that. So uh, the afternoon of 9-11, just, I, I just did it. I just started, started moving things. And, and you all were very generous, all right? No, seriously, I mean, we, we got the largesse of, of your tax dollars after 9-11. I'll use the CIA figure because it's easier to explain. I became the director of CIA in 2006. Okay. On the day I became director, I had two dollars to spend for every one dollar George Tenet had on September 10th. All right. So, so we had clarity. I had license to to go to this place, and do this mission, and we had a lot more resources. And and frankly, um, how to put this to make it sound right? Um, we're good at going to war. Um, we've, you, you have the most magnificent armed forces on the planet. And when the president says, go do that, we know how to do that. And we actually did some remarkable things. And I'll, I'll, I know you want to talk about how we, how we integrated our kind of electronic magic with the fire and movement of U.S. forces on the ground. You're right that Afghanistan is an intelligence-driven war. Yeah. That, of course, intelligence is always central to military operations, but it was different this time because the need for intelligence on the front lines in an active, responsive way seems to be the only way to find these people yeah. who are wandering around without yeah. uniforms and without really a being able to be traced in yeah. a specific way. Yeah, the, 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 the overly simplified way of thinking about this, in, during the Cold War, Remember the Russians and, and massive tank armies in Eastern Europe, and those of you with military experience in Europe, remember the Fulda Gap? You had to defend against penetrations, in Bavaria. and that was the American Army's task and so on. Yeah, the mantra then was, these guys are easy to find. <laughs> I can see a tank army. Okay. Hard to stop. Al-Qaeda was the reverse. Easy to stop if you could find them. And so this became an absolutely intelligence-driven war. And practically, what did that mean? How did that become implemented yeah. in terms of the extension of U.S. forces into these operating areas, first in Afghanistan, but the same ultimately would yeah. be the case in Iraq? Iraq, yeah. So a couple of things. So, so the normal rhythm you, you, you kind of read about or, or you, you see on TV is the, the, um, the intel guys prepare the thing for the operations guys. Okay, the, the intel guy goes in there and, and says, Here's this, here's that, here's the front line of troops, here's the terrain, and okay, big guy, go do your stuff. All right? In this war, very often, we would conduct operations. We would actually just go do something, all right, in order to tickle the enemy, to make the enemy communicate. All right? When the enemy doesn't know what you're doing and you surprise them, they, they lose discipline and, and, and they begin to fear for their own well-being. And I don't just mean personal safety, I mean for the well-being of, of their force. And, and the human instinct, when under threat, is to talk, is to communicate. And so I was down at Tampa uh, talking to Charlie Holland. Charlie was a good friend of mine. Charlie was a four-star commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. And we're having dinner at his house in Tampa. And uh, Charlie's a good enough friend that, that he didn't mind at, uh, by the time we got to dessert, to kind of pound the table. Mike, 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 I need actionable intelligence, actionable intelligence, actionable intelligence. And I said, I got it, Charlie. Let me give you another model here, all right? You give me a little more action, I'll give you a lot more intelligence. And that was flipping the model. Right, so that if they're quiet, you can't track them. Right, and if they're quiet, you know, if they're quiet, if they're not stressed, all right, they can send it by courier. They can wait for the next face-to-face. But if they're stressed, right. you got to communicate. Now, it's, you know, I made that sound more predictive than it really is in world li real life, but they trend to communicate when under stress. And in practical terms, this meant taking people, some of whom came to your agencies, whether NSA or CIA, from the military, so they had that yeah. kind of experience. Oh, yeah. But some were civilians, and yet they were moved into frontline positions, at least at command centers, so yeah. they could really be there to coordinate these information shifts. Yeah. 
So, so you have to understand, NSA is about half military, half civilian, okay? Uh, so it, it, it's kind of got this dual personality all along, and it is technically what's called a combat support agency. In other words, the Department of Defense should expect you to support folks in combat. That's just part of your task. The British counterpart, GCHQ, not a familiar name to most Americans, but it's the British equivalent of NSA. They're technically not a combat support agency. And so they, they feed most of their stuff up to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whereas NSA does both State Department and, and the Department of Defense. What we discovered is that um, if you're in the message file, I mean, if you're just kind of there and you're, you're doing your thing and I file a report and you send it forward, you're not in a fight. All right, and so it, it, it became very clear to us that we could not do what it is we did and succeed if we were only what we would call in garrison. We had to be forward. So in a, in a very non-doctrinal way, because after all, the first letter in National Security Agency, N, means national, all right? And so its, it's, it's instinct is it's supposed to be, in essence, looking more up than down. Because of the nature of the war, we started sending our forces forward, our forces, all right? And we began to integrate our people into American combat elements so that, in essence, we weren't creating reports anymore. In essence, we're, we're in live chat saying, he's, he's over there. He's about 300 meters to your left. And then we, we would bring friendly fire to him. Now, there was a cost to this. You reporting your book, I don't know at what point this was accurate till it may have grown since, but NSA lost 23 cryptologists yeah. in combat operations. Yeah. So this is literally the front line. This yeah, is no, not, no, we, you're not speaking metaphorically. No, no, not, not metaphorically. We, 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 we integrated with, with, with our forces. And, and it's probably more than you ever want to know about the SIG and Enterprise, but y you know, the, the, the tactical units have their own kit too, all right? I mean, they... They've, they've got their own radios that they can intercept, very short range, very immediate, battlefield focused. And the task now was, how could we integrate what they were doing with their organic ability to intercept communications with our national ability? And there, there are lots of organizational uh, classification barriers between doing that. And again, back to, okay, we got clarity. We know what we're going to go do. We broke all the way through those barriers. We actually had Marines in the forward line tuning overhead assets because they needed to hear what's beyond the next ridge line. And similarly, I had people back in garrison, and most of these folks were in Fort Gordon, Georgia, tuning Marine Corps antennas on Humvees who were in the forward line of advance in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Now, this is a transformation. This yeah. is... A, this is not something that is going to change, I don't think, as no. future combat operations, whether it's in relation to the war on terror or other operations. This is really a transformation in military capacities and in a military approach, is it not? Yeah, um, fundamentally, if you're an adversary of the United States and you emanate on a battlefield, you're gonna die. Emanate meaning send off a signal. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me come to in fact, I think the book is extremely well titled, Playing to the Edge. And you make, in relation to a number of uh, very important historical incidents that you're involved with here, you make the point that the intelligence community wants rules to follow and needs someone to set the rules. Now, the debate about how those rules are set, right. where they're where set, they are. Right. is something that the intelligence community may disagree with, whether it's Congress or the American public. Yeah. but you don't want to be running around without guidance about what to do. You want to be within the law, right. and, but you're willing to go, what your lawyers tell you is the edge of yeah. the law. Talk about, please, how the intelligence community shapes itself in relation to the limits that is set sure. for it. Well, there's a lot in there. Yep. Um, so we follow law and policy of the United States. Um, in, in the book, there's a chapter there called... Uh, Espionage, bureaucracy, and family life. Okay. It, yeah, it's kind of a hodgepodge chapter. And I, I, I try to explain the human dimension of the, the espionage enterprise, the bureaucratic burdens, the, the um, 
stresses on families. And I, um, I, three times in the chapter, I, I, I quote an American songwriter who worked a few blocks from here routinely, Bob Dylan, and uh, Beautiful Sweet Marie and his Blonde on Blonde double platinum album from the mid-1960s. And there's a line in Beautiful Sweet Marie that says, when you're operating outside the law, you really got to be honest. Okay. Now, I, I quickly add, and CIA, NSA does not operate outside the law, or at least not outside of American law. Okay, <laughs> is the way I put it. So, I mean, look, this this is an enterprise that's conducted in the shadows. All right, and and that, that's just the, the and that is just a reality you have to accept. But but it is not without bounds. All right. Playing to the edge means their edges. And we really need to come back to that question mm -hmm. before we're done. And we need clarity from the people we serve as to what are the edges they define for us. And, and that usually comes through the American political process, which is very contentious. I mean, you go back to the Federalist Papers, it was supposed to be contentious. Co-equal branches of government, competing, the lines between them not quite clear. So, so in here, for example, it's just not where the lines are. It gets who, who's got the controlling hand on the pen for where the lines are. Is it Article Two, the President of the United States, or is it Article One, the Congress of the United States? <clears throat> and, and so you've got all these dynamics going on. All we want is just tell us where the lines are. Just just tell us where our limits are, and then and then when the operational environment requires it we will play all the way up to those limits. Because why, why wouldn't we? You, you mentioned lawyers, yep. right? And my best lawyer once described to me the difference between a lawyer for NSA or CIA and a civilian a lawyer. A civilian lawyer is designed to protect his client. A civilian lawyer will tell you, well, that's probably legal, but you really should be playing back a little bit here because you don't want to make yourself vulnerable. Well, you know, a civilian lawyer is, is kind of built in cautious to, to make sure you're not in any legal jeopardy. My lawyer, Bob Dietz is his name. Uh, Bob would say that is an immoral position for the lawyer of the National Security Agency or the Central Intelligence Agency to take <clears throat> because his client is not the director. His client is the American people. And his job is to get you as close to that line as he can legally get you to that line. Because you realize, if I play back from the line, I may be protecting me, or more nobly, I'm protecting my agency, but I'm not protecting you. And so in this case, the moral compulsion is to go all the way to the limit, not, not randomly, not haphazardly, not casually, but when the circumstances demand it, you go all the way to the edge. So the most salient example, and this does not cover your time at CIA, but you write about it at length in the book, is the enhanced interrogation of a yeah. certain number of captives from the battlefield. They're being held in third country uh, sites, ultimately to Guantanamo. But coming more specifically to what were called enhanced interrogation yeah. techniques. Take us through the limits as you saw them in relation to that, or as the CIA defined them, <clears throat> and the line as it was drawn by CIA authorities, because obviously that line was challenged in the society at large. Yeah, it, was, it became debatable. This is a long story. Um, so I'll try to be efficient, but it's an important story. So, so right, I, I kind of inherited this program. You'll probably get to electronic surveillance sooner or later. I started all those, all right? That, that was me. <laughs> But when I, that's NSA stuff. When I got to CIA, this was already underway and already been made public by the Washington right. Post. It was very contentious. So very briefly, all right, just so we have the same set of facts. CIA held, depending on how you book them, about 100 to 120 Al-Qaeda, what we call HVTs, high-value targets, all right? People we thought knew a lot, not, not, not snuffy down here in the Al-Qaeda lower ranks people we thought had life-saving information. So again, depending on how you book them, um, and it's not because we lost some of them, it's just, you know, was, was that our prisoner? Was that really the Pakistanis' prisoner? How long did we hold them? Did we book them over here? We book them over here. So 100 to 120, 
right? Um, we got several fairly high-ranking or at least fairly knowledgeable people early on. Abu Zubaydah, all right, uh, is, is the first one. One of the most important and senior figures in the organization yeah. at that point. Yeah, actually, it, it, it's, it, you know, that's been challenged that we had that wrong. He wasn't that senior. He may not have been, but he seemed to know a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like, so, so whose phone do you want to listen to? The chief executive officer or a secretary? Okay. Abu Zubaydah was kind of like the secretary. <laughs> I've never had to ask myself that <laughs> yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> so keep in mind when this is happening. This is 2002. All right, we're not sure of the threat Al Qaeda poses to us. We don't have a lot of physical penetrations of Al Qaeda. I'm still trying to build up the signals intelligence intercept of, of Al Qaeda communications. We seem to be under great threat. There's no one here saying, well, let me tell you a line I've never used. That 9 11 thing, Hayden, don't overreact to that. Yeah. All right, yeah. never got that. And so, so George Tenet makes the decision. That we've got some high-value detainees whom we believe have life-saving information for us, and they're not telling us. And, and, and we don't have the time to work this through with patients, counseling, tea, and hummus, all right? We, we, we got to get this stuff. So George makes the decision to apply enhanced interrogation techniques. There are a total of 13. All of them, the reason George chose these is that they've been used in the training of tens of thousands of American airmen. Uh, and therefore, we had a body of knowledge with regard to the short and long-term physical and psychological effects of the techniques. And therefore, we felt we could present them to the Department of Justice, and they could make a decision that, yeah, based on the effects, these would not constitute torture under American responsibilities under international law. And so we applied these techniques. A total of 13. Um, they start way low, all right? Uh, one was grabbing somebody by the chin. That was one. Grabbing them by the lapels. That's another one. Slapping them in the face is a third. Hitting them in the stomach with the back of your hand is a fourth. And then you, you progressed. Up at the high end, up at the high end, you had diet manipulation, which was, frankly, 1,200 calories a day of liquid insure. Okay? Well, I mean, we're trying to break down resistance, okay? Um, sleep deprivation that, that went long, mm -hmm. really long, and then waterboarding. Uh, waterboarding was conducted on three detainees, okay? The last detainee to be waterboarded was March of 2003. George Bush took waterboarding off the table, all right? By the time I become director, we hadn't used it for three years. So, um, the agency is absolutely convinced that it got information through using these techniques that would not have otherwise been available, certainly in any, any timely manner. All right? Um, now, the, 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 man, that's really on the edge. These are really difficult decisions. But it was judged, given the totality of circumstances in which we found ourselves in 02, 03, 04, that this was the correct course of action. And we did build up a, a, great, a great body of knowledge, again, of things we would not otherwise, otherwise have known. So, and I've heard this from other folks yeah. associated with the intelligence community, you share the conviction that there was valuable intelligence yeah. drawn from these techniques. Yeah, no, I, they, they, I mean, the, the body of, uh, the, the record is, is overwhelming in that regard. You, you really have to start from a dark place to begin to say, oh, no, that's not good, that's not good. I mean, the people who did it, Right? Tell me, oh, no, we, well, look, a couple of points. We never asked somebody a question we didn't know the answer to while we were using these techniques. And this is not a scene from 24 where you say, um, tell me where the bomb is, tell me where the bomb is. Right? This was trying to get somebody who was in a zone of defiance into a zone of relative cooperation. All right? This, Never got over where to write and list, all right? But you got them out of the zone of telling you nothing to a zone in which you could actually. And then, after that, you just interviewed them, yeah. right? The, 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 the average amount of time for, oh, yeah, I said 100 to 120. Yep. A third, a third, if I hadn't mentioned that, I need to mention that. 
a third had enhanced interrogation techniques. So we're talking about 35 or 40 people, okay? And, and, and the average amount of time from defiance to let's talk was about a week to 10 days. And after that, it was just conversation, all right? And, and so we felt we built up, in essence, an encyclopedic body of knowledge. Well, tell me again about that meeting in, in Kandahar. Now, 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 when the Sheikh arrived, was it a white SUV or was it dark? Are you, I mean, seriously, we're, we're building up this, this encyclopedic knowledge so, so that later in the war, when you're, when you're trying to piece something together, all right, like, I wonder if he's using a courier because he doesn't seem to be communicating. Do we have anything in this vast body of knowledge that talks about someone who could act as a courier? Osama bin Laden, and so we built this all up. Now look, I, I got it in 06. I had different circumstances than George did. I knew more about Al-Qaeda. I knew more about the level of threat. I had more human penetrations of the network. I was not as desperate for information as George was, and so my, present, my presentation to the president was, we can step back. We went from 13 techniques to six. We went from indefinite Detain, detention to about 60 days detention. I asked, the president agreed, he made the program public, so we get more political understanding. You know, we could, we could have Americans go up or down about it. And the grand argument we get is, I don't want my country doing that, and you didn't get anything useful anyway. And my response, by the way, Barack Obama's CIA's response is, that first sentence, I don't want my country doing that, all that says is we share common values. The back sentence, you didn't get anything? That's not yours. That's ours. And our body of knowledge was we got it. So the sentence you got to say is I don't want you doing it, and I don't care if you got that information from me, which is, which, which is, a, which moral, is a legitimate position. It's a legitimate position. But, it but is. it's not one you would expect these institutions to take whom you have licensed to do certain things on your behalf. But the edges did come in, yeah. whether voluntarily oh, yeah. or not. Um, you are very critical of Congress and its um, sort of wavering in its willingness to do things. I want to read um, yeah. two quotes from the book, or start with one. In the end, the Congress of the United States had no impact on the shape of the CIA interrogation program going forward. Congress lacked the courage or the consensus to stop it, endorse it, or amend it. We finally simply informed them that we would seek legal authority from the Justice Department to use six techniques. Six. And that was pretty much the end. That's so the downshifting I did. All right, so in addition to the president making a speech, in addition to shrinking the techniques, in addition to shrinking the time of detention, we kind of went full money to all members of the intelligence committees. Now, that was probably a tactical mistake done early, mm -hmm. that they only briefed what's called the Gang of Eight, you know, the very, very limited number of Congress we should have briefed more members of the... Frankly, I, I just be very, very candid with you. The rule of thumb is, if you're doing something on the edge, if you're doing something controversial, tell as many people in Congress as possible. They generally don't leak, actually. Most leaks come from the executive branch. Okay? So tell Congress what you're doing, if it's really edgy, if it's really forward-leaning. And frankly, I'll be very candid with you, dare them to tell you not to do it mm -hmm. when everyone's scared and no one knows what the future is going to be. Okay, they, they want to be heroic about this, be heroic then. Don't be heroic six years later when these things have worked, everyone's feeling good about life, and now they get to go tis, tis, tut, tut. Mm -hmm. You write, most American intelligence professionals are well acquainted with the broad cultural rhythm connecting American espionage practitioners mm -hmm. and American political elites. Yeah. The latter group gets to criticize the former for not doing enough when it feels in danger, while reserving the right to criticize it for doing too much as soon as it has been made to feel safe again. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the drill. That's, that's very pleasant, no. <laughs> I would imagine. Uh, but, but, how do you know I, I, which I, I, side of the phase you're in, though? Well, yeah, all right. Uh, look, and I don't want to make light of, of, of the moral dilemma that these techniques cause. All right? These, these are very aggressive. You can probably tell I'm, I'm personally comfortable with this, but I know a lot of good people who are not, and I have deep regard for their views. Forbid, you know, this is not one you could pass on. You had, you had to make a choice. And, and the agency made a choice, and I frankly endorsed it, because even when I changed them, it wasn't because I thought George was wrong. I just simply said, George has his circumstances, I have mine.
Let's talk about another um, historical intelligence incident. Uh, this is back to when you're at NSA, and it's, it's not the surveillance, although we may have time to come to that. But I, I mean, people talk all the time about the intelligence failure in relation to weapons of mass destruction in yeah. Iraq. And that, um, NSA was part of the intelligence of it, community yeah. in that. How can you explain that? Because yeah. you write that in terms of your time at NSA and subsequently at CIA, speaking to colleagues there, there was no pressure, you say, to skew the intelligence towards a finding that there was a weapons of mass destruction program in Iraq, and yet it was completely wrong. Yep. How do you explain so, that? Lots of dynamics here. So, so there, there were two broad theories of the case that the Bush administration really wanted to have, which is different from saying they're dishonest. All right? I'm just simply saying they had, they had two positions, and, and there were members of the administration who thought both were true. One was Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Right? The other one was that there was an operational relationship between Iraq and al-Qaeda. We believed the first, we did not believe the second, and we pushed back against the second, frankly, heroically. We said, no, that is not true. And, if, and if, you, if you say it, we can't back you up, which is actually a pretty strong statement to a political leader when you say, when, if asked, we're going to say, no, that's, that's all wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, that really puts a cap on it. So, I mean, if we were just caving, we'd have caved on both. All right? <clears throat> no, that's wrong. That's not true. Don't say it. This one we actually believed. Now, we were wrong. And looking back, you know, wait, what were you thinking um, in, in terms of why did you believe that? But think of the circumstances now. Number one, after Gulf War I, and we finally got UN inspectors into Iraq, they were much further along in their nuclear program than CIA had estimated. Now, as much as I've talked to you about these organizations, they're still bureaucracies. And you know how bureaucracies respond to making mistakes. They trend back in the other direction. So that was one reality. The second, Saddam Hussein, for his own purposes, wanted the neighborhood to think he did have these weapons because of his kind of eternal competition uh, with the Shia Persians across the Shadow Arab Arab uh, in, in Iran. And so he was, I mean, we captured people who said, well, I thought he had them. I mean, his generals, right? So, so you had, so number one, you, you had us, overcompensating for underestimating. Second, you had Saddam leading the neighborhood on as if he did have them. Third, we really did have limited sourcing, all right? And there, there, there are unarguable tradecraft issues with how we vetted or did not vet the sources. In other words, how much did we challenge our own assumptions? So let me give you, I'm, I'm, in, I'm doing signals intelligence. Remember the, the intercept stuff, communications? I'm an NSA. I am in the room as one of the principals when we voted to, on the national intelligence estimate with regard to Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. I had had a personal conversation with uh, Condi Rice, uh, who was at that time the national security advisor. But Secretary Rice and I go back to her being an intern and my being a lieutenant colonel on the air, on the air staff. So we got time together. And, and on the, we were marching towards war. I'm in the White House for, for one reason or another, and she kind of, hey, Mike, what do you got? I mean, does he really have them? And I, I said, Condi, I, I got a room full of information that he's got a WMD program. Now, I have to add, though, it's, um, it's all circumstantial. Okay? Not, none of it's conclusive in its own right. Now, hold that thought. It's all circumstantial. We're going to fast forward the video here, and now we're in 2011. We've got a different president, and, and we're wondering if that tall guy in that compound in Abbottabad is who we think it is, okay? And President Obama has a pretty good relationship with, with Michael Morrell. You've seen Michael, and he's a CBS commentator, really bright guy. He was my number three. He later became Leon's number two. At CIA. At CIA, I'm sorry. And um, <clears throat> was acting director twice, right? So very well-credentialed guy, and President Obama, Michael, in their hearts, what do people at the agency think? Is that Osama bin Laden in the picture? I mean, it's a big deal. We're, we're going to go ahead and launch the Starfleet into Pakistan without telling the Pakistanis, right? And there are a hundred ways this could go wrong. And so the president, is that really him? And, and Michael tells a story that he answers, Mr. President, there are a range of views at the agency. 
They range from 50-50 to 90-10. That that tall guy has been Laden. And the president kind of responds, that's not really very useful, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Michael says, well, let me give you a little background. Anybody who touched the Iraq WMD thing, they're 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's done nothing but Al-Qaeda, 90-10. At which point, I'm imagining the president's kind of going, ah. Michael won't let us sit there. Michael leans for Miss President, one more thing. Every stitch of evidence we have that that man is Osama bin Laden is circumstantial. And frankly, Mr. President, we had more circumstantial evidence that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction than we have evidence that that guy's Osama bin Laden. So that's the nature of the job. Can you give us, I mean, there's security and classification issues here, but can you give us some specifics about the nature of the circumstantial evidence on sure. WMD? Sure. I had, for example, I had intercepts that we played up the street here at the UN. Uh, Secretary Powell making that big speech. I, I actually had a clear three... Um, Three, three intercepts of Iraqis talking about chemicals, all right? And um, they played them, and Secretary Powell played them, and they're coming over the loudspeaker and the Security Council, and the, the slide is showing the English, and so you, you see what they're saying and so on. Next morning, the post here runs, runs a headline, smoking intercepts, all right? And I'm thinking, they weren't really all that convincing. <laughs> I mean, they, they were, no, I'm serious. The impression was, oh, if that's it, we got them. They were talking, it wasn't like, uh, you know, give me the inventory of the number of, you know, of how much VX you've got, and don't forget to give me the totals for the sarin, too. I mean, we, we never got that. But it was these kind of oblique, indirect conversations. It, it's that kind of thing uh, that we had. There was also, there was also this, this incredible Iraqi secrecy around the, the elements of what we thought were the program, which, again, raises suspicion that, you know, they, why would they be going to such ends? There, there's, a, there's a subplot here. There, there, there was a debate about aluminum tubes that, that they were buying, all right? Really expensive, really finely crafted. We thought, well, and the only thing that makes sense that they would be so tight on the technical details of the tube is they got to be using these in a centrifuge. Nothing else explains it. No, that's, that's circumstantial, right? They didn't say, hope the tubes come for the centrifuge. We're really ready to spin here, you know? It, it, so we, we had to impute meaning to, to these different things. And again, given our lens, we lowballed it. He seemed to be acting like he had them. We viewed it through that lens. I, I, one final point on this. I don't want to... If you read it, by the way, three clicks, you can read this National Intelligence Estimate online. Just go Iraq, WMD, NIE, and you can read it, all right? In retrospect, someone who was in the room and raised his hand saying, I support, okay? It's not so much we were wrong. We were, right? Read the language. There is a false sense of confidence in the prose. The prose is more confident in the conclusions than we were. And, and that, again, it was just, that was just a human mistake. If you read that casually, you know, frankly, not many people in Congress read it, but those who did read it casually, um, it was, oh, whoa, man, these guys, okay, that's that, and off it goes. It betrayed a confidence in our conclusions that even we didn't have. And that was a, that was a big lesson learned for us. Let me shift a little bit because, um, as many will know here, that you've also been commenting on current events <laughs> with some frequency, but um, the, the intelligence community really has a principal client in mind when it goes about its business, by and large, and that is the President of the United States. And we're in a situation now where, most recently, the President referred to the FBI as being in tatters. Um, Leaders has, of the intelligence community as being political hacks? Political hacks and, and conducting a witch hunt. What is the impact of that, first, within the intelligence community itself, and yeah. secondly, on the president's ability to actually get yeah. and process information? So, so there are a whole bunch of challenges here. So 
Yeah, it's a little long, but I, this, is better, this is a better way of handling it. So there's always, there's always a challenge briefing a, briefing a president, all right? Um, you, you, let me just, there's always a challenge from the intel guy briefing the decision maker. But let's just amp it up. Let's just talk about briefing the president, all right? So you've got to get in the room. You've got to be in the room with the president. But you, but you come into the room through a, it's a metaphor, right? You come, through the, you come into the room through a different door, right? The intel guy's door is marked facts, okay? The president's door is marked vision. That's the one you voted for. Fact, vision. Intel, world as it is. President, world as we want it to be. Fact, vision, as is to be. Inherently inductive. Data, 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 data. Generalize conclusions, test a hypothesis, inductive. Absolutely deductive. First principles, again, the ones you voted for. How do I apply them to this circumstance? Fact, vision, as is, to be, inductive, deductive, inherently pessimistic. Okay? Bob Gates, who was DCI before he was SecDef, fondly says when a CIA analyst stops to smell the flowers, she looks around for the hearse. Okay. <laughs> Fact, vision, as is, want to be inductive, deductive, inherently pessimistic, inherently optimistic, otherwise he would not have interviewed with you for the job. Okay. And so there is this permanent tension because you, Intel guy, have got to get into the head of the vision guy, but you can't become him. You've got, you got to keep your tether to your door. Otherwise, you have no right to be in the room. You have, you have nothing else to offer than you're the fact-based, inductive, world as it is, modestly pessimistic human being. And so you've got to get into the head of the client without leaving your, your identity. Okay? That is always a challenge. Uh, it was probably easiest in the history of CIA talking to George H.W. Bush, 41, because he used to come into the room through the other door. <laughs> He used to be the DCI. If Secretary Clinton had been elected, I think this would have been a fairly light lift as well because she had kind of been acculturated to this as four years as Secretary of State. I, I could imagine, you know, going in there for that first briefing. She, oh, hey, guys, where were we? I mean, <laughs> and kind of picking it up. We always knew that this is going to be above average lift if Donald Trump were elected president of the United States. <laughs> Because all this stuff over here, God gave him three extra doses. Okay. Right. This is this purely descriptive. This is not judgmental. I mean, you, you accept the person as God made him. Inherently intuitive, right? Very transactional. Always, you know, Michael Gerson used to be George W. Bush's speechwriter, now writes for the Washington Post, says Donald Trump lives in the eternal now. There is no past. There are no future consequences. It's all now. So we always knew, ooh, it's going to be a little, a little above average here, getting into the head of this president, particularly one who really doesn't read, who's a visual learner, um, has no depth in foreign affairs because that's not what he did for, with his life, and frankly, is, is fairly disinterested in historical matters. I mean, I, I think it's just all public record. So it's going to be hard. It is an American tragedy that the first time we had to go have this conversation with President Trump, we had to do it on a, on a subject that a lot of America was using to challenge his legitimacy as President of the United States. Got this big step function, I got this heavy lift, and the first thing we go talk to the guy about is how the Russians fool with the election. Okay? That is a perfect storm, and it has created an incredible deficit in, in the intel policymaker relationship. What's the impact within the community of all this? So, the, the, the president has an a priori view of how the world works. All right, he, he's very, very confident in his own, almost preternaturally confident in his own intuition. And, and b before we get too judgmental, that's, that's the one that got him elected president when all the experts said that ain't going to happen. So, you know, all right? And now, you, here's another way of putting it. Okay? 
we, we don't spend a lot of time predicting the future to the president, all right? Um, that's really not our job. I mean, it's useful when we say we think he's going to go do that, all right? But fundamentally, what it is we think we provide in a day-in and day-out basis is context, the broad context within which something is happening, the broad context within which something needs to be understood, right? And President Trump does not function in terms of context. He just doesn't. I mean, I, I see no evidence. In the, I've, I've never met, met the man. I've never briefed him, certainly. But just in the public, what I can see, he, he doesn't deal in context. It's transactional. It's now. And, and context doesn't matter. So now you've got an enterprise whose whole purpose is to paint the complexity of life, to create the left and right-hand boundaries of legitimate policy discussion with a client who would prefer to go with his instincts, who is inherently transactional, and is, I think, fair to say, just roughly disinterested in, in context. And, and so now you, what, what you've got is this dynamic of the community trying to do its job, fundamentally pulling a president who thinks he knows the answer already back to, hey, you thought about this? Can I just, a moment, Mr. President, can I, can I, I mean, do you see the, you see the dynamic? So that's one, that's, that's just kind of the, the transmission belt thing. The, the other is the value thing, all right? And um, it, it does hurt when, when the president responded to that first dynamic I gave you and what we had to brief him on and the Russian thing. It, the, the president's methodology is not to argue the facts. It, it, it never. The president's methodology is to devalue and delegitimize the person bringing the facts he does not like. And so what you've got, the Bureau being attacked, intelligence being attacked, journalism being attacked. Not an argument on the facts, but an attack on the legitimacy of the fact bearer. And, and that's, that's hard. I don't envy Dan Coates, the DNI, or Mike Pompeo. We're very good folks, working very hard, and frankly, trying to serve the man the people of the United States elected, who carries the legitimate sovereignty of the American people. And, and, and you've, got, you've got this very real problem. My great fear, though, is that because of this dynamic, you know, attacking the legitimacy of the fact bearer, be it press or science um, or, or law enforcement or, or intelligence, we, we may do damage to American institutions that may take a while to fix. When the president Recall the president was in Vietnam, he met with Vladimir, and he said, you know, Vladimir believes he didn't do what he did, and remember all that story? And, of course, the president didn't say it quite right on the airplane, and he kind of had to walk it back the next day a little bit, and um, he said, no, no, I believe the intel guys, I believe the intel guys, especially since we got my, I got my guys in there now, so I really believe the intel guys. That is a nuclear detonation inside the American intelligence community that the legitimacy of the American intelligence community depends upon the person of the political appointee placed at the top. That is horribly corrosive and could take a long time for the community to dig out from under, after, after, even after we've changed president. What is the implication for, I mean, there are serious things going on in the world, yeah. the North Korea being perhaps the most salient. So, one assumes that the intelligence community is going to do its best yep. to provide the best information it has, but if it is not something that can connect with the predispositions or the predetermined views of the president, it's kind of a checkmate to the whole enterprise, is it not? Scary, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take that as a yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, just look at the record, all right? You can agree or disagree with the president's Afghanistan decision, but that was actually a decision made in regular order, all right? When he gave that speech at Fort Myer, very early on in the speech, he said, this is not where I began. This is not where my instincts were, and I generally follow my instincts. And then the next 20 minutes of the speech, he talked about what he was going to do in Afghanistan, which, again, you can agree or disagree with, but that was pretty much where the... the uh, Institutions of government wanted him to land. And oh, by the way, he told you about it in a 20-minute speech, not 140 characters. Right? So 
Check. That was good. Um, the Iran thing, I think, this is decertifying the nuclear deal. I think it began with the president wanting to just rip it up. Yep. And I think the institutions of government walked it back a bit. In essence, he gave a speech that kind of made it look sort of like maybe he was going to rip it up. It actually didn't have that effect. Now, it had an effect, all right? It wasn't to rip up the agreement, and that's dangerous and set things in motion that we'll probably regret. But again, it wasn't where it began. He got kind of pulled back. The Korea thing scares me, all right? I, I will give you the judgment of everybody I know. These guys are never giving that stuff up. They'd be crazy to give that stuff up. They've been to the movies. It was a double, double feature. I don't know if you've seen it. The first one was about Muammar Gaddafi, okay? The second feature was about Saddam Hussein. And the short subject in between was the Ukraine. Remember, territorial guarantees in perpetuity if you give up your weapons? So he knows what happens to you when you don't have this stuff. He's never given them up. And H.R. McMaster is going out of his way in the last four weeks to say we will not accept a nuclear North Korea, accept and deter, is not going to be the threat. Okay, so I got, I ain't giving them up, and we can't let them have them. That's really scary. And I, I really do have great fear. The decision today on Jerusalem, there is no one in the American intelligence community who would say, well, that's a great idea, boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me ask about um, General Flynn. I mean, I don't know how well you knew him along yeah. the way, but you're certainly contemporaries and colleagues yeah. Yeah. at the upper reaches of the uh, intelligence service. Uh, how do you explain all this? I, it, it's, anybody who knows Mike can't explain it. Mike had a wonderful record as a tactical intelligence officer. All that stuff, I told you, the SIGINT and integration, and he, he's 300 yards, 300 meters to your left, go get him. That, that's what Mike did. He was magnificent for Stanley McChrystal. He, he developed the JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command, rhythm. Okay? Ra raid 1, pocket litter, cell phones, database. Raid 2, pocket litter, cell phones, database. Raid 3, we're not to midnight yet, all right? I mean, it's, and, and, and Mike was the orchestrator of that for Stan McChrystal. We did wonderful things. Um, he had never really served at the national level, and so he had a rocky time as director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And he, he left, um, he, he was kind of pushed. Mm -hmm. out because, you know, good, good people, tough decisions. Mike left. I think he left mad, angry, and he, he just seemed to get wrapped up after being in government and in the campaign and, 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 and uh, uh, saying things that were, were intemperate at best, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, so it's, it's, it's a sadness. I mean, I, I don't know him that well. I, I hope he gets beyond this quickly. Um, I think he made it an important personal and tactical decision to agree with Bob Mueller in terms of the plea bargain, and we'll, we'll see where it goes forward. But it's, it, it, you can probably tell, it's a little hard to talk about, because he, he, he's done some really good things to keep you safe. I, I, I mean, I'm struck, I saw General Hurtling on CNN the other night. And he was he, pretty harsh. He was very harsh, but he also expressed that pain as well, yeah. that a general officer at that level yeah. has a, sort of a commitment to integrity that really cannot be compromised. Yeah. And, 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 Mark, and Mark was, in essence, saying, when he does that, that's all of us. Yeah, yeah. And that was his point. Yeah, and I assume uh, it feels that way to you as well. Yeah. yeah. Let's see if we have a question or two from the floor. I didn't have an upbeat close to that particular <laughs> session. Uh, back there. Hi, General. Um, how does the Muslim ban uh, affect? The policy for the U.S. Now. That's great. Thank you. That's a, okay. That's a, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so you, so the courts upheld the ban, uh, ban 3.0, right, which is far softer, far more general, and so on. Um, 1.0 is a, based on a misreading of Islam, a misreading of history, and a misreading of the threat to the United States of America. Back to this. I know how this works. My instincts are strong. I'm going with my instincts, all right? The, the president during the campaign pictured for us an apocalyptic threat from refugees, which the data does not support, and an absolutely dystopian vetting system, which the data does not support. And then in day three, I think, of the administration, they, they shove 
this ex executive order out, out the door. I, cards face up. I, I have signed every amicus curiae brief anyone who's put in front of me in, in order, in front of the court, as a view as to this is a bad idea. Right? And it's, it's a bad idea because, number one, the, the specific data is wrong. All right? Um, I mean, I can never get you to zero in terms of absolute guarantees of safety for anyone entering the country. But the description during the campaign was just horrible. By the way, you have not heard any intelligence professional in any way, shape, or form say this was a good idea. You, you have not, you, I don't care how much TV you watch. None of my tribe has been out there supporting this. Okay? At best, they've maintained their silence. And, and, and it's, it's, it's not just that it's not needed. It's that it's dangerous. Because when we do, particularly 1.0, all right, which was, it really was a Muslim ban, right? Um, it lives the narrative of Al Qaeda and ISIS. And that narrative is that there is undying enmity between the West and Islam, and there can be no peace. And so when the candidate says they hate us, all of them, well, most of them, most of them hate us, all right? I mean, that, that's out of the Al Qaeda ISIS playbook, that this, this, this is a clash of civilizations. And I think most people in my profession will tell you this is not a clash between civilizations. This is a clash within a civilization. This is a struggle within Islam. And I'm going to pull you back a bit in history. Not significantly different than Christendom's struggle in the 17th century. Thirty Years' War, Peace of Westphalia, the, place, the position of faith and reason in, inside how we, how we deal with ourselves. And Islam is going through that struggle now, and the parallels are overwhelming. And I, I get it. San Bernardino was intentional. Orlando was intentional. Brussels was intentional. Paris was intentional. But fundamentally, those attacks were spillage from what is overwhelmingly a Muslim-on-Muslim -Muslim struggle. Ninety-five percent of the deaths in this thing are Islamic. And when we create the Muslim ban based upon the false premises based upon the belief they hate us, they all hate us. We shouldn't let any of these people in the country. We reinforce the side within this Islamic civil war right, that we want to lose. And, and so it was beyond not necessary. It actually, and by the way, um, you, you need to go online and find the amicus curiae briefs. Look at the people who signed it. They're all like me. Right? People have done this for, you know, no softies out here, all right? People have done hard things like, I, look, I've authorized sleep deprivation. I've actively participated in meetings where, yeah, kill him, right? No, we're not soft on this. This was just wrong. It was, and, and just look at the people who listed it. So there is an example, all right, where, where, where instinct, campaign rhetoric, a priori assumptions got turned into action and with none of the <coughs> ameliorating, moderating effects of the fact-based inductive guys. One more, maybe we go. Uh, Sorry, that's too long an answer, but it was important. This one here, please, just wait, yeah, you, please. Wait for the mic, just if you'd stand up, and if you would make it a short question, because we're coming to the end of the program. General Hayden, as the Derns, uh, how concerned are you when you have a personal email server operated by a <laughs> government employee with 3,000 pieces of classified email to include gamma subs, who, who, and there'd be no prosecution. Who, who are we referring to? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, this is a Hillary Clinton question. Oh, oh, oh those, OK. No, I, I oh. figured you knew it, but not oh, necessarily right, everybody yeah. was in the, the, in the adepts. There's no justifying it, all right? Um, I don't know. I'm out of government. I don't go back for briefings so I can sit here and talk candidly to you folks and not figure out where did I learn that and can I say that publicly or so on. So let me just tell you the things I, I would say. I, number one, there is not an intelligence service worth its salt on this planet that not, did not have access to that server. All right? It's kind of like, duh. All right? Um, what I can't understand is why the folks around her, the permanent folks, whom, many of whom I know, at state, let this go. I mean, at some point, you know, somebody's got to say, <clears throat> Madam Secretary, a, a private moment, perhaps? <laughs> and then 
you go in there and, and you stop it. And, and so, and I, I've got no view on the legal process and, and, and all that, uh, but it, I, there is no explaining do, do, doing, doing that. No, oh, by the way, the defense cannot be, cannot be, well, it was just unclassified. For number one, you, you've made a case that it wasn't just unclassified. But let's just assume for a minute that it truly was unclassified. I would move heaven and earth to have access to Sergey Lavrov's unclassified family email network. <laughs> All right? I mean, it doesn't have to be classified a secret to be really interesting to, to folks like us. So it was just irresponsible. Well, as you can see, there is a lot to talk about, and I hope we'll have a chance to bring you back here to talk about it again. But I did want to say, in terms of the book, um, and you've really captured your voice in the book, and you've put it on display if, for if, us. If you get the DVD, it is my voice. <laughs> or, or, the, or the CD, right? But it, it really <laughs> captures, in all kinds of really difficult circumstances, the way in which intelligent professionals think about really difficult issues. And you've captured that, and I think done a great service Thank to you. us can all I, in doing that. Can I then uh, just... Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Please? So one of the points I try to make is I try to humanize your intelligence enterprise. Okay? And, and, and what, I, what I wanted to describe, and I, I kind of suggested it, so thank you, that's very kind. What, what I, one of the best things I've felt about the book is I've had folks come to me and say, I see myself in there, people within the community. I gave my book to my parents. They finally said, ah, oh, I know, under I understand. You need, to, you need to know that, that these people work in the shadows for you, all right? That they are not alien beings. They, they went to the same high schools, same colleges. They go to the same churches. I get asked by a lot of people, what kind of people work for CIA? And my answer is, well, they're like your friends and neighbors. And if you live where I do, they're kind of your friends and neighbors, all right? I mean, my wife Janine is here with me. We go watch our granddaughter play soccer. On a Sunday afternoon in Northern Virginia, go, okay, I know him, I know her, I know him. I mean, and they share your values. They are just required to apply our values, our shared values, in circumstances you will never face and probably about which you will never learn. And, and so one of the purposes of the book was to communicate that message as best I could. It doesn't mean you have to agree with anything or everything. It's just they are, they are who we are as a nation. Okay? The way a nation spies is as reflective of the values of the nation as much as its art or its poetry. And I, I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking General Hogan.